Cool. So uh, I'm not going to be able to type and uh, answer any type messages during the talks, but if you want to save those messages, you're more than welcome to. Okay, so every week I first of all recommend a book that I either own or want to own. I don't get endorsed to advertise these. I'm just advertising them because I think you should just buy them because they're great books to own and they will add to your knowledge. So this book I do own um, is called Pathfinder. It's written by a very accomplished South African nature guide and she's been in the industry since the 70s as far as I understand and has a lot to offer. She's a fantastic artist. Her name is... Janesta Polela, you can find her on Facebook, and you can also find your Pathfinder on Facebook, or you can email her at info at yourpathfinder.co.za. Really good book for nature guides, conservation students, for just general enthusiasts of biology. It's a lot of technical stuff and some fun stuff. And uh, beautifully illustrated, really comprehensive, just good, good, good core material for anyone that wants to learn about the environment. And you can use that material to study what we're learning here or just expand your own knowledge. Okay, so we're all trying to make sense of the world that we live in. We live in a very confusing time. Um, coronavirus is kicking our asses at the moment and um, amongst economic depression and everything else. And it's just nice to make, it's nice to make sense of things, okay? And the one thing that we can make sense of is the living world, plants and animals and fungi and so on. So we can structure this, we can understand it. It's not that hard, it fits nicely into little categories and it makes sense. And it's wonderful just to understand something. Okay, so we're naturally gifted at finding patterns, grouping and structuring. We're primates, all primates do this pretty damn well. Okay, it's something that we're just inherent to doing and we like to structure things. We like to make sense of things. We like to find patterns. So for the longest time, sorry, I've got another person joining the party. Okay. For the longest time, humans have tried to devise methods of making sense of the world that we live in. And, oh, sorry, this is really funny. Uh, when it comes to making sense of the world, the first known written records of grouping, we obviously went in fact further than this, but the first known written records of grouping were from the Egyptians around three and a half thousand years ago. So this is a painting, a hieroglyph of an Egyptian sycamore fruit tree. Uh, I don't speak ancient Egyptian, so I can't tell you what it says, but obviously he's got a little weird wrappy thing around there saying that he can eat it. So it's a depiction of an edible tree. So the Egyptians categorized trees by being edible, un inedible, having medicinal value or having no value or having some sort of architectural building value. So that's how they grouped their plants. So they were trying to, again, make sense of the world they lived in and have an understanding of their environment. Much, much later, a man by the name of Aristotle, about 1,200 years later, who was a Greek scientist, philosopher, poet, and scholar, about 2,300 2, 2, years ago. Now, for, uh, Aristotle was a phenomenal man. He was adept in many subjects, from economics, poetry, he spoke a variety of languages, and all around just fantastic guy. He was also the instructor and teacher of Alexander the Great, probably the greatest Greek general of all time, who conquered an empire from Rome all the way through to Egypt and, and um, India. So a phenomenal instructor in his own right. And Aristotle spoke many languages and studied many different things. So during his time on the Isle of Lesbos in Greece, he dedicated his life to studying biology. He was amazed with the amount of living things on the island. And he was fascinated with all the little mechanisms and how everything just interacted and how there was almost so many things going on. Uh, unlike mainland Greece, where there was a lot of civilization, uh, Lesbos was fairly underdeveloped. So there was not that much human interaction and he was amazed about how much it actually was going on. Incidentally, the word Lesbos is actually the root word for the word lesbian. In Greek society, homosexuality wasn't illegal and male and female uh, couples, male, male and female, female couples were very, very common. On the Isle of Lesbos, female and female couples were very common. So the word a lesbian was a female couple from the Isle of Lesbos. And we still use that word today. So uh, he devised a system of grouping all life. Okay. So everything was either a living, a living, everything living was either a plant or an animal. Pretty simple to understand by today, but uh, back then they didn't really categorize things. They didn't consider living plants as living things. They were just something that happened. But he said, no, plants are actually alive. They have biological functions. So it was either a, it was either a plant or an animal. Today we know there's a lot more to it than that. 
So animals were further divided into animals with blood, aka animals with a spine and red blood, or animals without blood, aka animals without a spine and no red blood. Again, very rudimentary by today's standards, but um, back then it was revolutionary. It was amazing. So you can see a nice little chart that he made up over here. So um, it was a very simplistic view, but it set the tone for biological sciences for the next 2,000 years. It remained relatively unchanged. No one really questioned it. No one really tried to change it. There were some interpretations, but they were terrible. And um, no one really made any sort of decisive discoveries with biology beyond some very basic rudimentary discoveries. Much, much later, along came a man called Carolus Linnaeus. And he was born in 1707 in Sweden, died in 1778, the age of 71. Now, he was a phenomenal, phenomenal man. He was a Swedish botanist, okay, studying plants. I love plants as well. And a revolutionary scientist. I mean, the man was a genius upon genius. So he gutted various systems of classifications of plants and animals, totally tore them to ribbons, said they're absolute bullshit. We don't need them. They're rubbish. We're moving on. And um, because of this, he made a lot of enemies in the scientific community, but he was actually right. So he developed a system of classifying organisms based on relationships of increasing and decreasing similarity. Before this, there were, plant, there were categorizations. If it flew, it was a bird. If it swam, it was a fish. So people will be lumping seals and fish together and birds and uh, bats together, which obviously is nonsense by today's standards. But he started finding all these flaws and cracks in the system and he just scrapped everything and started from scratch. So um, he was clearly brilliant and he was extremely arrogant on top of the fact that he stood a lot of trouble with a lot of other scientists. And he often talked about how much smarter he was and how much more accomplished he was and how much more right he was about everything. The problem was he actually was right. So it didn't help him that, uh, or it didn't help other scientists that he just knew more than them. So this is what he wrote about himself, and I love it. It's absolutely cool. Um, no one has been a greater botanist or zoologist. No one has written more books, more correctly, more methodically from personal experience. No one has more completely changed the whole science and started a new epoch. He wrote that about himself in his 60s. <laughs> so, a little bit arrogant, but um, he was right. Okay, so he wrote a series of papers called the Systema Natura, which literally means the systems of nature, if you speak Latin. Uh, and we call that today taxonomy, which is the system of classifying all living things on the planet. So he proposed that everything living should have a Latin binomial, and binomial means two words, name that is unique to every species. So every plant and every animal needs a unique name. And it should detail the relationship to other species. So it should actually be, uh, Liz, you're arriving late. Oh, sorry. Let's go back. Okay. So it should detail the relationships to other species. In over 250 years, we have not devised a better system for identifying relationships between living things, but we've improved upon his work. But it is still his work that we've just extrapolated on and improved upon and made better. But it fundamentally hasn't changed on some tweaks. Okay, so understanding taxonomy is literally understanding the tree of life. And it really is a tree when you understand what we're going to talk about in the next half an hour. So we're going to look at the basics of taxonomy, its impact upon the world, and why it's important. Whether you study biology, nature guiding, conservation, whether you just want to understand gardening. Um, you really have to have some understanding of taxonomy at even a most fundamental level, especially if you're a biology student. Um, and it just gives you an insight into the world. So it might seem boring, but it's the groundwork, uh, the groundwork for truly understanding the living world. So taxonomy allows us to understand why all living things behave the way they do and why they look the way they are. So we're able to make assumptions about extinct species based on their relationships to living ones, as well as predict how future species may behave long down the line, long after we're gone. So taxonomy is a process of involving classifying and naming organisms into groups. So it produces an organized system for naming and classifying species via a process called statistics. Now this is one of my favorite, favorite subjects. I uh, get excited for it. A lot of people think it's really boring, but it's like one of those things, the more you get into it, the more exciting it is. Okay. 
So taxonomy it helps us show the connection between all living things and how they're related. So we have an Asian elephant here from Sri Lanka, and we have an African elephant from South Africa, from Bozulu Natal, Tula Tula Game Reserve to be exact. You can see they're both elephants, but there are some fundamental differences that show that they are, while they're obviously related, they are different, but they're both elephants. So we can see at some levels, the categorizations have to separate. They can't just be together. So this is cladistics. This is a very, very basic high school level, you know, grade seven, grade eight level, high school level example of cladistics. We've got a bald eagle, alligator, antelope, sea bass, and lamprey eel. The one thing they all have in common is a notochord or a spine. However, a lamprey eel does not have jaws. So we don't include them with the rest of those guys. So bald eagle, alligator, antelope, and sea bass are together. Now, a sea bass or any fish does not have lungs. So we scrap them to the side and say, sorry, fish are not included in animals with animals that don't have lungs. Now we're getting closer to the top of the tree. We're looking at antelope, alligator, and bald eagle. Bald eagles and alligators have gizzards. It's a bird-like stomach. Antelope do not have gizzards. They have a mammal-type stomach and they have hair. So again, we separate them. Now, at a very fundamental, at the most basic level, right at the top of the tree, the one big difference is that bald eagles have feathers, alligators do not. So you can see that we start getting more and more complex with our arrangement. And this, you're getting more and more exact with your connections and separating those branches on the tree. And this is literally understanding a tree of life. So all things are grouped according to a system of categories of increasing similarities. At the bottom, all animals of the spine will be in one group. At the top of the tree, all animals that happen to have um, feathers will be grouped into one group. But obviously, it gets more and more exact to that at the top. Scientists, however, do disagree because we're human and we make mistakes and we interpret evidence in different ways, much like a court case. Uh, one judge might interpret the, court, uh, the evidence in one way, my judge, one another judge will interpret the evidence in another way. So you can make mistakes. There is a final answer. There's always a final answer, but we're humans and we can make mistakes. So sometimes we sit and discuss things for ages and trying to figure out exactly what we've gotten wrong. So we work to show the similarities and relationships between groups as well as the differences. So we have an African part over here. And we have a marabou stalk over here. So we can see that they're birds. They're birds, but there are some significant differences between the, these two birds, okay? They've got some things in common, but they've got some things different, okay? So all things uh, are placed into groups or categories based on similarities they share with other organisms. The further down you go the list, onto the list, the more similar the species. The rankings are based on evolutionary relationships shared between these species. If you can look at a dog, it's an easy example, a dog. So all animals are in the kingdom of animalia. We have a phylum, which is what types of animals, very broad categorization. Animals with a backbone. Now, there are many kinds of animals with backbones. Okay, but specifically, we're talking about mammals, these kinds of animals with backbones. Now there's many kinds of mammals. Uh, are we talking about cows? Are we talking about seals? Are we talking about mice? No, we're talking specifically about carnivorous animals, cats and dogs, okay, and all their cousins. So now within the order of carnivores, there is a family of related type carnivores. Those are all the dogs, the canids, the canidae. And within the canids, there are many kinds of dogs. There are jackals, there are foxes, there are wolves, there are wild dogs, um, there are um, ghost dogs, there are coyotes, there are many kinds of things. So we're now specifically dealing with true dogs, canis. And what specifically what type of true dog we're dealing with? The familiar dog or the domestic dog. Okay, so as you go down the list, you can see there's a closer and closer and closer association, and eventually you get to one animal only. At the top, um, at the very, very top, it's a very broad categorization of just four animals, and at the further you go down the list, or the further up you go the list, if you're looking at a tree, the more exact the species becomes. We're going to do a bird as a contrast to see how it works again. We have the Rufus Snape lock, this little guy on the photo. He's also an animal. He has a spine. Now he has the difference. He's not a mammal, he's a bird. 
And there are many kinds of birds. There's eagles, there's ostriches, there's penguins, and so on and so forth. But specifically, we're talking about passerines, songbirds. Okay, now there are many kinds of songbirds. There's larks, there's thrushes, there's crows, there's canaries, there's finches, there's shrikes, and so on and so forth. Specifically, we're talking about the Elordidae, the larks. That's what kind of songbirds we're talking about. Now, there are many kinds of larks. There's forest larks, grass and larks, there's bush larks. And now here, we're talking about the Merafrin's bush larks. And what kind of bush lark? The African bush lark, otherwise known as the Rufus Nape lark. So it becomes this very, very exact pinpoint explanation of where the animal fits on the tree of life. Okay, so there are taxonomical divisions, which make it pretty easy to understand. So there are seven main divisions, but there are lots of subdivisions. And if you guys are studying biology, uh, zoology, botany, anything like that, you guys will encounter these. If you're not studying these subjects, you're probably not going to encounter these. So don't get any gray hairs over it. So if you're not a scientist, don't worry about all the subgroups. So we have a kingdom, a phylum, class, an order, a family, a genius, genus, not genius, and a species. Okay. And as you can see, going down from domain to kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, it gets more and more and more exact, like a pinpoint. It finally points like an arrow to the final animal that we're looking at. So they're not just one big mess of a, of a group. There's an arrow that gradually points to one exact animal. And this is important because when you're dealing with medicines, when you're dealing with animal behavior, when you're dealing with biology of animals and reproductive measures, you need to know how the animal fits into this tree or, uh, and where it relates to that animal so you can learn how to treat it, how to expect what kind of behavior you can expect from it, uh, how its reproductive cycles work. And these all relate depending on the species. If you had no idea where this animal fits into this tree of life, you won't understand how it relates to other animals and why we would treat it a certain way. We don't treat dogs and cats with the same medicines because they're very fundamentally different creatures. However, because seals are fairly closely related to dogs, they are, we can use similar medicines and similar forms of treatment to seals as we could to dogs, far more than we could with other cats. We can also treat bears in a very similar way that we treat dogs because they are more closely related to dogs than they are to cats. So understanding taxonomy as a vet actually helps, in, especially as a wildlife vet. Um, likewise, if you're, uh, if you're doing uh, ethology, study of animal behavior, you can understand why all cats and their kin like to make animal pastings. So mongooses, hyenas, cats, they all make animal pastings, and you understand that because they're all related to cats. Okay, so science is continuously growing, shifting, and making new discoveries. It's a fascinating, fascinating um, world that we live in, and there's always new discoveries. So sometimes something that we thought was right for many years has been proven to com be completely wrong. For example, um, we just, uh, for a long time we thought that pigs and hippos were related because of some basic dental structure that they had. Uh, recently we discovered that in the 1980s that pigs, and, sorry, um, hippos and um, whales were more closely related. So we've scrapped the, the previous evidence and go with the stronger evidence. Okay, so we have to recategorize things. So it's not important to know everything, but in your field, learn what you need to learn. And also, even if you're not in that field, learn it because it's interesting and it can help you one day. There's no such thing as useless knowledge or knowledge is valuable. So it's important to keep up to date with new information as much as possible. So sometimes new information contradicts what we previously thought, but if there's strong evidence, you need to embrace it, okay? Even if, it show, even if in, the, in the, the previous court case we found the, the criminal guilty, but all of a sudden new evidence comes forward and shows that he actually he couldn't possibly be guilty, we have to change the conviction and let him free because the new evidence has shown that actually he wasn't guilty all along. He was in China doing something else. Okay, so you cannot just stick to your guns and say, I'm not going to change my mind. If you get new evidence, you need to change your views and you need to change the way you see things. So we know now through fossil and genetic evidence that all living things have a common ancestor. At one point, you and every other living thing on this planet had a common ancestor. If you go back about 4 billion years ago, you and all the bacteria on this planet have a common ancestor. If you go back around 80 million years ago, you and a mouse have a common ancestor. Okay, and this is the tree of life, understanding where all these things connect on the branches of the tree. 
So a lot of people think that taxonomy is boring. It's in fact a rich story detailing our link to all living things on this planet. Okay, and it's a humbling, almost spiritual experience just to realize how connected you are to everything else on this planet. Humans are not autonomous. We're all part of this living massive tree and everything is part of one giant family. Okay, and then when you understand that, you have a little bit less hubris and you can also just appreciate every other living thing on the planet and just treat it with a little bit more respect. So warning, we have a lot of information coming up. Okay, if you don't remember everything, if you feel like you don't need to, don't stress, this is purely for information purposes. Some students will find this very valuable some will find it very boring. Okay, uh, this is here to help you understand that there's a whole world out there that we don't only that we don't know that we only know a fraction of. So, stepping forward a bit, we're going to be talking about two very important scientists, uh, Whitaker and Woese, a American and Swedish scientist, respectively. Um, they categorize systems, but uh, sorry, not systems, living things based on three criteria. So, the structure of its body, how it's shaped, how does it get its food and how does it reproduce? So for a long time, we thought mushrooms were parts of plants. However, they have some structural differences that are not in any way related to plants. They also do not make their own food like plants. So they can't be plants, they don't photosynthesize. Again, they can't be plants. And they don't reproduce the same way as plants. So again, they can't be plants. So we need to have a separate, a separate kingdom for mushrooms or for funguses, okay? And for a long time, people thought they were coral plants, but they don't photosynthesize. They need to. Make, they don't, don't make their own food. Um, they, they don't have cellulose like plants, so they can't be plants. So this is how we categorize things now into kingdoms. So above kingdoms, there are three basic domains. These are just general categories for how we define life. The first domain is archaeans. These are very primitive bacteria, super primitive, the oldest things on the planet. The second domain is bacteria what we have everywhere around us. And the third domain are eukaryotes, which contain several complex kingdoms, funguses, plants, animals, and so on. Now, before we go forward, we need to talk about a man called Robert Hooke. And Robert Hooke was the father of studying microbiology. That is the face of a man who studies microbiology for a living. He discovered bacteria okay, and microorganisms using a microscope. He was an English scientist who was the first known person to discover microorganisms using a microscope and to find the existence of a cell. He was a genius of his time and contributed to biology, astronomy, physics, economics, poetry, uh, various intellectual pursuits, and he actually helped develop the modern clock, for example. He was an absolute genius. Okay. So before his discoveries, no one really knew where diseases came from. Uh, we just guessed, we thought they were magic. You, know, you got sick, it must be magic, it must be a curse, it must be God's will. Now we actually understand that there are microorganisms that live in water, live on our skin, we breathe them in. And he discovered these, and um, along with guys much later, he, they were the fathers of microbiology and virology and various other sciences, okay? So he contributed a lot, and we can be thankful to this man that we understand little tiny things exist. So over the last 250 years, we've made countless new studies in microbiology. And um, yeah, we would still be dying at a rate of knots if it wasn't for this man. So um, looking at the domains of life, as you can see here, he has a basic map. The most rudimentary here are archaeans. They are at the bottom over here. And then we have eubacteria, which shoot off on another branch. Um, they're all single-celled organisms. And then we have the eukaryotes which make a far more complex tree. And they become protists, animals, fungi, chromistas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and become a little bit harder to define of what they actually are. Now, uh, going forward, we need to understand something about cells. We're not gonna talk about cells today because it's a whole biology class and I don't have the energy, I'm sure you don't have the energy. If you've done high school biology or if you're doing university biology, you should know this already, between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. So simply put, if it's alive, it's made up of cells. Everything alive either has one cell or many cells. You, for example, have many cells. In one centimeter, uh, one centimeter square of your skin, you've got around two billion cells, give or take. Okay, so you have you're a multicellular organism. Something like bacteria, for example, is a single-celled organism. 
Okay, and again, you can have about one or two billion of them on a centimeter of your skin. So cells either have a nucleus or they don't have a nucleus. Now this is, so if you're a eukaryote, you have a nucleus, which means you have a lot of energy. If you're a prokaryote, you don't have a nucleus, which means you tend to be a little bit lazier. All complex multicellular life is made up of cells with a nucleus. So let's go on to the archaeans. Archaeans are single-celled microorganisms without a cell nucleus or any other organelles. That's what they look like, tiny little sausages. So they occupy a broad range of habitats, oceans, soil, marshlands, intestines of animals. They live in acid, they live in volcano vents, they live in thermal vents underneath the ocean, they can live in extremely high temperatures, they can live in very, very, very high soil conditions. They can live in, in conditions that you couldn't even imagine life to live in. Okay? We define these guys as extremophiles. The word file means lover. Okay? Same as the word philosophy. Sophie means knowledge. So philosophy means the love of knowledge. Okay. Uh, dendrophile is a lover of trees. Dendro being tree, file means lover. So an extremophile is something that loves to be extreme, like bodyboarding and surfing. <laughs> no, they love extreme conditions, they love volcanoes, they love acid, they love extremely high soil content. Okay, none of them are known to be harmful in any way, they just kind of exist, they're just everywhere that it sucks to live. So you're probably not gonna find too many in your garden, but they're around. You might have some on your skin and you might have some in your stomach. Okay, they contribute to many of life's processes on Earth, such as nitrogen and carbon cycles. They Help break things down. Now, bacteria. You bacteria, you means you means true. They are single cell microorganisms as well. And they have these wiggly little things on their tails, okay, which we call flagella. So they have rigid cell walls like plants, similar to plants, and they have these little tentacles called flagella, which help them move around the water. Not very effectively, but they do get around. So they do not have a cell nucleus, which means they tend to be quite lazy. And they're found everywhere on earth. They found you've got them living on your skin and your tear ducts. They're living in your sweat glands. They're living on your hair. They're living underneath your fingernails. They're living on every single surface of, of your table. They're living on your phone. They're living on your paper. They're living everywhere. They live in your shoes. They live in the water. You cannot get rid of bacteria. Every single bit of earth's surface is covered in bacteria to the point that all their biomass actually weighs more than the biomass of all other living things. So if you take the weight of all bacteria on this planet and the weight of all the funguses, the grasses, the trees, the humans, the fish, all the animals, everything else, and you put them on a scale, the bacteria will weigh more. We found bacteria up to six kilometers in the sky. We found bacteria 10 kilometers below the earth. They're everywhere. Okay. About 60% of your body weight, your body weight is bacteria, to give you an idea. So only 40% of you is you. Okay, um, essential, they're also essential for nitrogen cycling and nitrogen fixation. And many serve as beneficial to, for making antibiotics and food digesters in our stomachs. And they break down food in our stomachs and you, you need them. You wouldn't be able to break down food if they weren't in your intestines. And uh, we use and produce wine and cheese and medicines. And some of them are extremely harmful like E. coli, which I've had several times. Um, and they cause thousands of deaths every year. Except for mine, I'm still alive. I don't plan for E. coli to kill me. Now, let's talk about viruses. Viruses are on the table at the moment. Corona is a virus, COVID-19, as we know it, HIV is a virus, and everyone seems to be worrying about antibacterial spray, but viruses are not bacteria. To give you an idea, a virus is 10,000 to 50,000 times smaller than bacteria. So if you can get 2 billion bacteria on a centimeter of skin, times about 10,000 to 50,000. We're talking in the trillions of virus on your skin. Viruses, okay. So they're odd, they're not actually alive because they don't do anything. They, they don't eat, they don't sleep, they don't have any biological processes. They're just like little bits of code. So they're not actually classified as living things. We don't include them in any of the domains, we don't include them in any of the kingdoms. They're like the biological equivalent of a computer virus. They literally are the same thing. They're, they're actually a molecule covered in a protein coat that replicates inside the cells of a living host. So they don't do anything. You can put a, you can put a tablespoon of virus on the table, it does nothing. It, 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 
at the very most it'll break down or biologically decay, but it doesn't actually do anything when bacteria will try to replicate. It's only when you interact them with your body that they actually start to get functional. They tell your cells to do things like make more of the virus and to get sick and so on and so forth. But they don't do anything, so they're not actually alive. It's like a, it's, in a layman's term, you could think of it like a venom or a poison. Very simplified explanation, but if that makes sense, then that makes sense to you. Okay. Um, so now we're going to eukaryotes. These are either single-celled or multicellular organisms. And they can either be mobile or sessile, non-moving. They have a cell nucleus, which means they've got tons of energy. And they're found everywhere on the Earth. And these are the most complex of all living things. They include all the living things that you can see. Trees, plants, animals, funguses, and so on and so forth. And that includes you. You are a eukaryote. So let's talk about a kingdom. So under the domain of eukaryotes, we have multiple kingdoms. The largest kingdom is, sorry, um, jumping the gun. For example, let's talk about grasses and cows. One is an animal and one is a plant. Uh, originally, we categorized everything as plants and animals. Today, we have a few more. Now we've discovered there's quite a few kingdoms, um, but they're still in debate. Some people say four, some people say five, some people say six. We now also have chromistons, which are single-celled, but some are multicellular. And these are seaweeds and their cousins. So they're a diverse group with little in common except for their simple structure. They include algae that are the most important primary producers and oxygen providers. And some organisms in this group can cause serious diseases like malaria. Okay, so a seaweed's not a plant, it's actually a chromistin or a protistin. They do have a cell nucleus. And they love to be in water. Fungi. They reproduce by spores and absorb their food. They're not able to make their own food. They need to break things down. So there are about 80,000 species of fungus known uh, today. Mushrooms and molds, yeast, infectious ringworm, and athlete's foot. Yummy yeasts. And fly agaric mushroom. Very pretty. And they're found in every habitat, but they tend to do better on land and water. Plants. I think we all know what a plant is, but let's go through it. They're multicellular with specialized tissue. Each, plant, each part of the plant has a different role. Okay, so they're able to make their own food through photosynthesis, and they reproduce either by seeds or spores. Uh, they're unable to move independently from one spot plant uh, to one spot to another, but I think we know that plants can't move. Animals. They're all complex multicellular organisms. And no animal is able to make its own food. We need to eat, we need to kill. Whether it kill a plant or whether it kill an animal, we need to kill in order to survive or destroy another living thing in order to survive. Uh, back. So most are able to spontaneously move independently and of their own accord. So within each kingdom, and you get various phylums. We're not gonna worry about any of the other phylums except for animal phylums today because they're fairly easy to understand. Okay, so it's clear that a bear isn't very closely related to a spider, yet they're both animals. That's a sloth bear from Sri Lanka, and that's a rain spider from South, from South Africa. They're both animals, but there's some fundamental differences. One of the most obvious differences is that a bear has a backbone and a spider doesn't. We use these basic criteria to group them to different taxonomic groups, okay, which is a phylum. Animals with a backbone, animals without a backbone. So there are 35 or 36 phyla. Um, we're not going to worry about all those 36. That's just too much. So phylums are grouped into animals that share basic physical similarities. They have a spine or an internal skeleton, or they're covered in an outer shell, or they have no spine and no shell. So the most familiar phyla, which I'm sure you should know, chordates, animals with a spine, arthropods, animals with the jointed legs and an exoskeleton, and mollusks, slugs, snails, and bivalves. Okay, they tend to be very squishy with a hard shell. So let's talk about chordates. So these are animals with a backbone. They include fish, birds, reptiles, mammals, and amphibians. And they do not have an external skeleton. They're quite squishy on the outside. Arthropods, they have an external skeleton, no internal skeleton. They are mobile and have jointed legs. They include insects, arachnids, millipedes, crustaceans, like crabs and lobsters, and so on. Centipedes as well. Mollusks, the final group that we're discussing today. Mollusks have a soft, unsegmented body. Okay, they are usually protected by a hard outer shell, 
and they include snugs, snails, clams, oysters, mussels, and squid, and so forth. Okay. So what we're going to do, guys, we're having a 10-minute break. I'll bring my glasses on. We have a 10-minute break. We're going to come back at, at 7:50. Uh, we can use the same username, same ID, and the same password. Same ID, same password. Type in there. And we're logging in at uh, 1950. And I will see you guys back in 10 minutes after the break. We are 40 minute sessions running up. And I'll see you guys now. All right. Ending session. So I'll see you in 10 minutes. That we are through the hard part. We're on to the easy part now. So, as you can see, here's a nice little diagram that I drew with my amazing Photoshop skills. So, this is a kingdom of animals, and within the kingdom of animals, we've got three separate phylums: we've got the chordates, the animalia, sorry, the chordates, the arthropods, and the mollusks. Now, within each of these phylums, we've got various classes. I'm not outlining all the classes because I have no time for that. And then you can see under each of the classes, we've got ser several orders. And each of those orders branch out into several families. I've just drawn one order here, branching into three families. And then taking one family and using an example of different genuses, and then from one of those genuses, several species. And you can imagine how complex this gets uh, if you had to draw all the families out together and all the orders and all the genuses and all the species. But at no point do any of these lines ever reconnect. Much like a tree, we've got two people arriving, admit all. So, much like a tree, none of these branches will ever reconnect. So they spread out like a tree in all the different directions and they'll never ever reconnect ever again, ever again. So it is effectively like imagining a tree. Okay, hence the term the tree of life or taxonomy. So it's pretty obvious that a mongoose is only distantly related to an eagle. And now we're talking about classes. They both have spines, but they're pretty different. So both have a backbone or a spine, but the eagles lay eggs and has feathers. A mongoose does not have, does not lay eggs, nor does it have feathers. So a mongoose is more closely related to those animals with which it shares a wide range of common characteristics. It's warm-blooded, it cares for living young, it produces milk, it has a body covered in hair, not feathers or scales, etc., etc., etc. We call these animals mammals. Okay, so we have a class of mammals. Other classes include reptiles, amphibians, birds, aves, Pisces, but we've now broken that into different classes. So Ignathans, Chondroarchthes, and Osteoarchthes, say that three times. Arachnids from a totally different phylum from the arthropod phylum. Insects also from the arthropod phylum. And um, so the first four that we've mentioned there, sorry, the first five we've mentioned there are from the chordate phylum and the other two, we've got Ray who's arriving now, sorry. Um, and the other two there from a totally different phylum. So you can imagine how these start to get a bit complicated, but you can start to see how the relationships start to group. And then we have another person behind there. Okay, so the class mammals has many, many animals in it, okay, with many different characteristics. It could be a hell of a mess. So while seal and a zebra are both mammals and they share certain characteristics, they have other features that they don't share. So the seal is a carnivore and the zebra is a herbivore, amongst other things. Okay, so these differences define the order of the animal. This over here is a, is a carnivore. He's also very naughty. Stop biting my feet. Okay. So organisms in one order all have certain characteristics in common. These characteristics are different to animals in other orders. Some of the mammal orders include carnivores. So if it's a carnivore, it's probably in the order of carnivorans. Artiodactylans, these are animals with two hooves, and we say with cloven hooves. So deer, antelope, cows, giraffe, they're all artiodactylin. That's the big fancy science word. Chiropterans, which are bats. Primates, monkeys, apes, and humans. 
Rodentia, rodents. Lagomorphs, which are rabbits. Fun fact, rabbits are not rodents. They are lagomorphs. Slightly related to rodents, but they're their own order altogether. Okay. So, amongst the orders, we get different families. So, we're going to go into carnivores because they're fairly easy to understand. We know what cats and dogs are. So, if it's in a family and we're using the scientific name, it ends in the suffix idae. So, if it's a plant, we end it with the suffix ACA, but we're not dealing with plants today, so don't worry about that. So, lions are on the order carnivora, but so are seals. They're both carnivores, but they're very different. So, both are carnivores and clearly different. And so, we now we need a smaller group, a family, to separate them and say that these are their own thing. They're not related to each other beyond the fact that they're carnivores, but they're not very closely related. So a family of animals consists of a range of very similar animals with common characteristics. All cats are grouped in the family Felidae because they have a similar skeletal structure, they have similar teeth, and they have retractable claws. So other families within the order Carnivora include Hyenidae, that's all the hyenas, Viviridae, all civets and genus, they're a family, Mucilidae, badgers, polecats, otters, skunks, they're all mucilids, Wolverines as well. Canidae, wolves, jackals, foxes, okay, there are, and Ursidae. Okay, there are many other families, but these are just some examples. You also get Herpestidae and various other Pinnipedidae. We're not going to get into that. So Ursidae are bears. So these are various families within the order of carnivora. Now, within each of these families, so you can imagine a family, like I've got cousins and second cousins in my family. And we've all got slightly different surnames because we're not very closely related. I'm a bread and come, my cousins are Drakes, and I've also got cousins that are Rose, cousins that are Atkinsons, but we're all the same family, likewise with animals. Um, so you can imagine the word a genus is like a surname, except it's like an Asian surname where they say the surname first. In China, the surname always comes first. So if my name was Bread and Cump, sorry, if my name was Nicholas Bread and Cump, if it was a genus, you would say Bread and Cump, Nicholas. So the genus is the surname. So within the family Canada, all the members are very similar looking, but they have specific differences that need another unit of classification, the genus. Aristotle also came up with this word, amazing guy. So we have a golden back jackal there. Jackals are clearly different to wild dogs, which means they need to be separated differently, again, okay, to different groups. So we have different genuses for them. They're both clearly dogs, and they're obviously related, but they are quite different, actually, when you look at them. So within the family Canidae in Africa, there are the following genera. There's the Canis, which are true wolves and dogs. Okay? In North Africa, we actually get gray wolves, like in Europe and Asia. Uh, they're very small populations, but if you go to Tunisia, Algeria, or Morocco, you will find gray wolves up there. Dogs being the Afrikaners dog, which you see in every village in South Africa. And your common house dog, that's a, that's a canis. Lycons, which are your African wild dogs, there's only one species. And then you get vulpus, which are your foxes, bat foxes, and so forth. So these are the three genuses or genera that you find in African dogs, okay, or African canines. Um, all right, so a species is a population of organisms that should be able to breed and produce offspring. So if you are the same species, you can breed and make babies, and those babies can make more babies, and so on and so forth. Interbreeding between different species in nature almost never occurs. It sometimes occurs, but almost never. There are exceptions, like everything. Lion, lion leopard hybrids have been recorded, and lion tiger hybrids have been recorded in nature in India. Very rarely, like one in a million. Uh, and they're almost all sterile, so they're not a, they're not a species. So if interbreeding produces sterile offspring, um, sorry, usually interbreeding produces sterile offspring, but sometimes, just sometimes, they're actually not sterile. Like with plants, a lot of grasses, two species can interbreed and actually make a new species, very simply put. So grasses can actually make new species all the time. Um, and with some animals, in particular frogs, they can sometimes produce new species through interbreeding. But it's very rare and almost never happens. So now we've talked about what a species is. So you can say that my species is Nicholas. All Nicholases are the same. 
Okay, and so that's what a species is. All Cape buffalo are the same. All Mozambique spitting cobras are the same. They're able to interbreed and have babies. If they're not able to interbreed and have babies, and those babies can breed, then they're not the same species. So now subspecies or races. Now a subspecies is the same species, but they tend to look a little bit different, usually because they're geographically separated. So they're able to breed with members of the same species from other areas, but they usually appear different. So here we have some giraffe subspecies. You can see they're all giraffes, but they look different. They're, some are black, some are brown, some are white, some are splotchy, some are geometric, some are slightly more stripy, some have thicker blotches. They're all, in, in every area, they look like that. So it's not individuals, that's what the population looks like. So these are subspecies. And you can see they're geographically isolated from each other. An interesting little story was in South Africa in the 1960s, we had blasted out most of our giraffes from trophy hunting, unfortunately. And all of a sudden we realized that tourists like to see giraffes, but we had shot all our giraffes. So we started bringing all our giraffes in from all other parts of the world. And we realized these giraffes, well, let's say parts of the world, from other parts of Africa. We realized that these giraffes all look very different from our giraffes. And they said, oh, screw it, let them into breed. And so the Southern African giraffe, which is supposed to be a thoroughbred subspecies of giraffe in South Africa, most of them are really messed up hybrids of the Maasai giraffe, of the, um, the Nubian giraffe, the West African giraffe, and they've just been mixed together with all these various other subspecies. So only in very isolated populations in South Africa do you get thoroughbred Af South African giraffes, and trophy hunting is purely to blame for that. So the name uh, that we give to giraffes, or oh, sorry, giraffes to all animals, um, in scientific names are Latin. Now, the reason why we give them Latin names is thus. So we use Latin because it's a dead language. Um, it has no political affiliation, it has no cultural affiliation. It doesn't matter whether you're Korean, Japanese, uh, Filipino, it doesn't matter if you're Mexican or Portuguese or South African or Zulu or, or, or Shangan. No one uses Latin today as their language, as their native language. So we use it as a scientific language. So whether you are a Japanese scientist, Brazilian scientist, or a German scientist, you can all agree to use Latin for scientific names. And without having anyone say, hey, why, why does your culture get to have that name? So another problem is that common names vary from family to family. In South Africa, Birds are given a thousand different names. I've heard the names, the black-headed bulbul, the dark-capped bulbul, the toppy, um, and you don't actually know what you're talking about. So scientists just negate this whole issue, and zoologists and conservationists negate this by saying, I'm going to learn a scientific name. So if I've got a German scientist, a German conservationist, or a Brazilian conservationist, we're all on the same page. So local names often have no scientific background, like, um, Afrikaans name for a for a solifuge, which is a type of um, arachnid, is a barskima, a beard cutter, and they don't cut beards, so there's no scientific name behind that. Okay, so common names also vary from area to area. Everyone's got a different name for the same uh, name. If you speak to a German, they call it a gnu. If you speak to uh, an Afrikaans person, it's a wildebeest, and if you speak to an English person, it's a wildebeest. So, which name is it? So, and again, another big problem is that multiple species share the same name. Buzzards in America are types of vultures. Buzzards in Africa are types of birds of prey. So is it a vulture or is it a bird of prey? And if you talk to an American, you think you're talking about a, bird, about a vulture. If you talk to anyone from anywhere else in the world, you'll think you're talking about a bird of prey. So using the name vulture in science, I'm sorry, the name buzzard in science doesn't actually help us. So, Again, different languages all have different names. So if you learn Zulu, like in Fezi is the, Mo is the Zulu word for Mozambican spitting cobra, and in English we call it the Mozambican spitting cobra. So if you don't speak Zulu, and if you're a Zulu scientist, you only know the word in Fezi, no one knows what you're talking about. I'll give you an example here for a tree. This is formerly Acacia robusta, now Vichelia robusta, and has many common names depending on where you go in South Africa. The ankle thorn, if you live in Kwajalein Natal, robust thorn, Splendid acacia, the river acacia, broad pot acacia, the brackthorn tree, and so on. So which one is it? So we all agree to learn the scientific name, Vichelia robusta, and our lives are just so much easier if you're actually studying the plant. 
can just say, okay, we all know exactly what I'm planting. So one scientist writes about robust thorn, another scientist writes about river acacia, one uh, conservationist talks about broad pot acacia, and another conservation talks about ankle thorn. We're all confused. So we learn Bacillia robusta, internationally agreed scientific name. Okay, sometimes names change. And we don't know why and how we change these names and why we give these animals these names. So in the past, everything was based on similarities, based on skeleton, body shape, and structure, the morphology, and fossil evidence. Evolutionary biology today plays a major role. It is the, it is the basis for all modern taxonomy. And we use genetics and DNA to show the relationships between living and extinct species. So it often results in odd groups of animals being put together, like dugongs, manatees, and elephants. For a long time, we thought the dasi was the closest relative of an elephant, but now we know that the dugong is actually genetically closer to the elephant, even though it lives in the ocean and it swims around like a seal. It's not in any way related to a seal. It's actually more closely related to an elephant. Okay, and again, um, I'm not a geneticist, so don't ask me to interpret this for you. So we can look at the differences and the similarities between two very different creatures. We've got a mouse and a human genetic similarities over here, and you can see there are some differences and there are some similarities. I do not understand this. I'm not going to answer for you because we need a geneticist to explain this. But you can see they had compare the two charts side by side and they're able to pick out differences and similarities. Likewise, we can go on to a more traditional method before genetic studies came around and look at fossil records based upon where they are in the, fossils, uh, in the rock strata. And we can compare and say, at what point in time did this animal come into existence? Or what time did their fossils start appearing? Because before a certain time in history, there are no fossils. And after a certain point in history, there are no fossils. So they had to exist at this time in history, 65 to 45 million years ago. So we can say that, okay, these animals occurred in this time, and we can see that they obviously are relatives of two different species. So we can deduce that these two species must be descended from that one species because both species share common characteristics with that first species. Okay, and names sometimes change. So we often have to revise information based on new data and new facts that come up. Um, sometimes we have to scrap all the data we have and start from scratch, and it is frustrating. And unless you're a scientist, you don't have to stay up to date every single day, once every 10 years or so, just you know, restudy and learn some new facts and make sure that you know what's going on. Um, however, learning is fun. And when I was studying, I thought this was bloody boring and I wasn't interested. But actually, as I've gotten older, I've realized from an almost spiritual, you know, holistic component, how fascinating this is and how much more rewarding it is to actually understand how everything ties together and where we're all related. The fact that we're all just one big happy family just gives you a true appreciation for everything on this planet. So here's another chart over here showing the relationships between the various types of antelope and the deer. And um, for a long time, we thought the Kreisbok, the Sharps Kreisbok and the Southern Kreisbok were very closely related. But through recent genetic studies, we've actually shown the Stembok and Sharps Kreisbok are actually more closely related than the Southern Kreisbok. Um, and Again, we just we, we reconfigure things and we rediscover things. Later, we might find out we're wrong again. But currently, with the current evidence, this is where we stand. So that is the tree of life. And there are around 8.7 million species of plant, animal, fungus, bacteria, and so on on the planet. In 1940, we thought there were around 200,000. Uh, in 2006, we thought there were around 2 million. And 2018, we now know there's over 8 million. So we're making new discoveries every single day. So we find out more about our planet and how we connect to each other. If you went back 200 years ago, no one would know that humans evolved from apes. They had no idea about this. But now we realize that we actually have common ancestors with chimpanzees and orangutans and bonobos. And um, it's humbling when you actually interact with them. And we now can understand why certain kinds of animals behave the way they do because they actually behave the same way. Like, for instance, we don't know why the hyenas and mongooses behave the same way in many respects, but through genetic studies and fossil studies, we realize that mongooses and hyenas have a common ancestor. And that would explain that why in many ways they have similar behavior and similar biology. Okay, so everything living today is one giant happy family, whether you eat each other or not. So that is the tree of life. Um, and you can find this picture anywhere online. 
and you can uh, download it and look at it. It's obviously a very, very simple summary and you need to dedicate 40 years of your life to actually understanding it in depth. But this is just a basic diagram of what's going on. So my references with Lion Watchmaker, The Story of Life and the Environment, Evolution in Minutes, Vertebrate Life, The Ecology Book, A Short History of Nearly Everything, Wikipedia, great for brushing up if you just forgot some facts, Pathfinder, the book I told you about in the beginning, Basic Biology, great for university and high school students, and nature.com. Subscribe to nature.com today. It is a fantastic website, and you just can never learn too much from that website. All right, so all the photos were taken by me, except for open source media diagrams. And um, yeah, structuring was inspired by various other PPTs that I've seen, and I'll be using other designs in the future. Thank you from myself and Tabo the Rana from Tula Tula.